to another episode of Geeky Gentleman History Month, the month in which we discuss the contributions that geeky gentlemen have made to history, but that have been ignored by a biased educational system, except not at all. I'm Sid Partu. Joining me today is... A geek for fun. Ah, yes. So here we are to discuss your um, personal responsibility for the atrocities of the British Empire. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, they invaded us long before they invaded you. (laughs) (laughs) We we give you a little history lesson on the British East India Company. (laughs) Uh, Anyway. (laughs) Yes. No, today we're here to review a movie. Steve, what movie is that? All right, so... I, and I have good reason for this, so we can talk about the the reasoning behind it if you want to. But um, I wanted us to talk about Tim Burton's 1994 biopic, Ed Wood. I, you know, it's one of those things where, like, you know, when, when you uh, hear someone talking about certain things, like piecemeal here and there, and then they're like, oh, you should watch this thing. And I go, oh, that's where all this came from. Because you were talking about Bela Lugosi and, like, union stuff, like, really hard a couple weeks ago. And then I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, so he watched Ed Wood a couple weeks back, huh? No, no, I actually read a Bela Lugosi uh, graphic biography a few months back, which is where all that stuff came from. But then Ed okay. Wood is also part of that, yeah. That was, um, it was just very funny to see that line up the way it did. No, there, so that that gets into the reasoning. Um, I picked Ed Wood on purpose. Um, I I wasn't gonna pick it initially, but then the nature of the conversation we had last week made me think, let's uh let's Dark Knight Rises this shit. Let's make this retroactively into a trilogy as if we were going here the entire time. Uh, that's not a dig on Rises. That's just what happened. Um, in in two episodes ago, at the end of Horror Month, we talked about the Wolfman and we talked about monster movies and Bela Lugosi and his relationship with people like Lon Chaney Jr. and Boris Karloff and all that stuff. Uh, And then last week, we talked about biopics and docudramas and stuff, and you and I kind of went back and forth on this idea of, like, what's the artist's responsibility to actual history? And I kept making the point of, like, artists and historians have a lot more in common because art is historical in the same way that most history ends up being artistic. Um, And I like biopics a lot, but I also, like, especially love that weird subgenre of historical film where it's not actually about the events it says it's about. It's actually about an entirely separate thing that's very counterintuitive to the history it's built on and instead is about, like, the person making it or their life or their perspective. So, like, movies like like, um, Ford vs. Ferrari doesn't really have as much to do with Ford versus Ferrari in the 60s as much as it does with um, the director talking about the fight between artists and studios using that historical event as just a metaphor for it. And I think Ed Wood kind of connects both the, the Bela Lugosi history we were talking about and that genre of biopic that we were talking about together into a movie where I feel like this is a really good example of If you made the movie straight about Edward Wood Jr. as he actually was, then I think the movie would have been far less historically significant and a lot less sympathetic to the person and what his legacy ultimately was. And by 
fictionalizing it, you actually get a better understanding of the person than you would have if you just laid out the events literally. So that's why okay, I wanted to talk about it. No, no, that's, that is actually a really interesting point, because kind of as we were watching this, I kind of got that feeling. Um, so I decided not to do any research on Ed Wood in and of himself, which is like, normally I just don't because I'm lazy. Um, but like, this was just a very particular thing of like, man, I, I was watching this movie, I'm like, I almost want to like look up some of the scenes that they're like recreating and see how one-to-one -one they are, or how like... Um, how far Burton took artistic license here or there. Uh, but I, I decided to pull back from it because I was really curious of, like, how far off um, the take here is because ultimately what this movie about is about is not Ed Wood. It's not about Bela Lugosi. It's just a, a really interesting statement about the importance of artistic integrity regardless of what that artistic integrity produces. Yeah, um, and specifically, it's about Tim Burton and Vincent Price, not Bela Lugosi and Ed Wood. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that's kind of why I picked it, and I thought that was, that was an, an interesting avenue into it. Um, I don't know if you're a big Tim Burton fan, but I do kind of feel like, if not Edward Scissorhands, Ed Wood is the movie that's like, at the center of his filmography as this is the movie you need to watch to understand what the fuck Ed Tim Burton's deal is because it, I think it's where he's the most honest about what he cares about and where you get like the most intimate sense of what his ideas are and where they come from and he does all that through the vehicle of Ed Wood which is a, an interesting way to do it because you're kind of conflating these two people but it is a lot more about Tim Burton than it is about Ed Wood at the end of the day but I am curious what did you think of this? I uh, know I really, really fucking like this movie. This Yay! was uproariously funny. It's so um, good, <laughs> it, dude. Haley was watching it with me, and she, like she was giggling and laughing at a couple of the bits here and there. But like that scene where he needs the Bell Lugosi look likes, and then he just like st starts closing the door and then stops and goes, "Oh wait." Keep your Sunday afternoon free. We are gonna go get baptized. I fucking <laughs> lost so my shit. <laughs> it's so funny. Just oh my god! By the way, we're gonna go get baptized. Like just the fucking grift and the the deal making of this. And you know the funny thing that that like kept entering my head as I was watching this is like. So really what you're saying is there's, like, business, the way business has been done in California has never actually changed. It's just the subject has changed from being the entertainment business to now the technology business. Because Ed Wood, and, and it's funny because Burton couldn't have predicted this because Silicon Valley was really what it is now yet. Um, but Ed Wood is, is just a fucking... Uh, tech bro you know yeah. Yeah. everything about what he does it's all just a grift and it's an interesting thing because it's like an, an inherently um slimy gross kind of character and in, in just about any, any time you've got a grifter um someone who's just telling you whatever you want to hear in order to uh to get what they want out of you um that's always portrayed very negatively but Burton goes out of his way to portray, no, this guy just really, really loves making movies. And he's really bad at it. But he's really good at convincing people to keep helping him do it. One of my and favorite... also, he likes Bela Lugosi. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite things about the movie is um, at the end, when it does those title cards that tell you where everyone was at the end of it in real life, um, and it ends Ed Woods on him being named the worst director of all time. And like, mm -hmm. that's its little statement on him. And you spend this entire movie watching him, being endeared to him, enjoying this sort of like naive optimism he has about artistic integrity and in making movies. But more importantly, making movies with his friends and people he cares about and just doing the weird kooky things in, that come into his mind and and quoting along to his movies as the actors are saying it and like just being really enthusiastic about it and none of it's good 
but at the end of the day, he wants the opportunity to do these things because that's what he finds purpose in in life. And that he's stuck in, a, in an industry that makes you into a grifter, where he, you have to make promises that you're never going to be able to keep, where everything runs on money. And a lot of Tim Burton's movies are ultimately about outcasts and monsters in uh, in a context where the real monsters and, and the real people that you're supposed to sneer at are the suburban happy people and capitalism mm-hmm. at large. And like th- tracing all that back specifically to Ed Wood and his obsession with monster movies is a really interesting exercise, but it also just is such a loving portrait of him. And it's, he says in an interview somewhere, uh, Tim Burton, where he's like, if you made this movie with any sort of objectivity, then Ed Wood would not be a sympathetic character whatsoever. But you, if you want to make it interesting, you have to approach it from his eyes. You have to approach it from his earnestness. And so, like, he read a book about Ed Wood's life, he read Ed Wood's letters and stuff, and he was enthralled by just how sincere and happy this guy seems to be, even when he was delivering some of the worst things you've ever heard. Um, he he makes this joke about like how Ed Wood can say in five sentences what any normal person can say in one. And <laughs> that's kind of what he wanted to capture, is that kind of weirdness. And in Ed Wood, he finds a kindred spirit for himself, because his relationship with Vincent Price and getting to work with him on a couple of movies is Ed Wood's relationship with Tabela Lugosi as it's laid out here. Um, and it's really interesting to see like old school 30s monster movies that Bela Lugosi would have starred in are also the foundation of the aesthetic that Tim Burton draws from for his movies in the 90s. So like it's mm-hmm. this really cool like cycle. And that's why I say like as a historical artifact, I think this movie is way more historically interesting than any book you could read about Ed Wood. I, I certainly would agree with you in, in that regard. Um, for me, the thing that really sold me on this movie is just how fucking funny it was. Like, yeah. the I think the first joke that really, really landed for me is when he gets Bela Lugosi to come to the studio for the first time and he's in the middle of a conversation. He's like, no, transvestites. Get me transvestites. <laughs> and he hangs up, and then Bela Lugosi just looks at him and is like, what kind of movie are we making? <laughs> it's just so like, poor Bela Lugosi thought he was about to be in like a fucking dirty movie, but he's not saying no right now because he needs the goddamn money. <laughs> oh, that was so tragic. <laughs> I, I love uh, Martin Landau as Bela Lugosi in this. He's so good. His comic timing is off the charts. <laughs> oh my god, when he fucking crawls in the um, in the fucking pond with the octopus. Fuck, it's cold! <laughs> <laughs> with the fucking Transylvanian accent. <laughs> It's also like there there's that sort of like nice sort of tragic twinge too where like he's trying to get him to film outside of his house and he gives him that spiel about like being a businessman who's like really in a hurry and he's not enjoying his scenery and Lugosi does the exact opposite. Um and it becomes like this really touching poignant scene um of like the the last little bit of him captured on film where he's just like walking out of his house and smelling the roses and stuff and like you see the the tragedy and how that's morphed into Plan 9 from Outer Space. But at the same time, there was some kind of truth to that. There there was some kind of like emotional reality between Ed Wood and Bela Lugosi in that moment where he did really love this dude. And the movie he made in Plan 9 and used that footage wasn't about exploiting Lugosi, although one could argue he did do that. Um, oh, it certainly. Was, um, <laughs> But it it is in that scene, he, what he thinks is the best way to honor him is to put him in another movie, especially a movie that he thinks is great, even though it's not. I, I legitimately the the way that you watch this and you you see it all through his eyes, mm-hmm. um, it does make you just want to like go fucking watch these movies even though they go out of their way to make the movies look terrible still. Oh, they're awful. <laughs> you, know? you should not watch any of them. <laughs> I, 
it it seems like a fucking good time though like i legitimately it seems so fucking funny um the way that like you know aren't you gonna do another take on that he fell and the the cross was cardboard and it just crumbled and it's it looks so hokey. No one's gonna notice details like that. Fucking sixty years later, and you get cinema sins. But um, movies are not about the details; they're about the big picture, like he said. I just, I fucking lost it. It's such a funny mentality. It's like, no, this guy, you know, he's got, he's got uh, ambition, he's got vision, but he doesn't have talent, mm-hmm. uh, is what it came down to. And so he's got like, it. it I think every artist recognizes elements of themselves in this portrayal of Ed Wood. Um, Because I think everyone notices those flaws in their own work and gets that little voice that goes, ah, that's kind of drawn back on it. You should maybe go correct that. And then you get the other voice like, nah, it's fine. No one will even notice. And then someone does and just like fucking eats you alive. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that was just so perfectly represented on screen there. Because like he, he'd blow off these huge things and he'd like he'd create these ridiculously elaborate uh, explanations for things that it's just no, just do another take when fucking Lobo crashes into the set on the door frame and damn near topples over the wall. He's like, no, no, it's real. If you think about it, he'd be doing that every day. Um, it's like, no, that's just a bad take. Just do another take. Uh, and and it's just, I think that's just such a, like, knee-jerk reaction for every artist to have. It's like, nah, it's, it's fine. I just don't want to put in the work for that part right now. I'm happy that it's past it. And you are until you get to the other side when someone starts to notice the mistake or starts to point something out because the other like the other side of the pendulum you get in in seeing edward's reactions here are the reviews right because like people start to to label in with the reviews and just start like tearing him apart and he's just so depressed uh when when he's reading those reviews and his, his first girlfriend just keeps saying, oh, well, it's just one person's opinion. It's just one this, it's just one that. And he's like, you're right. And he, he gets, like, the energy back. But it's it's really interesting to see that that um, that artistic pendulum there. The compromises yeah, I mean, and then the devastation at the uh, the lack of appreciation. Yeah, with Ed, there there's something about him that I think everyone wishes they could have, which is not having that little critic in your head every time you put something down on paper. Like, every time, you, like you mentioned, every time you like write a line of something, there's a part of you that's like, that's not quite right. It's never going to be good. Like, you're going to rewrite or reshoot or remake the same thing over and over again because it's never going to be perfect. And there's a part of you that wishes you could just kind of shut that off and and just keep plowing through and ed has like this genuine it seems like inability to notice the flaws in his own work and he's depressed people don't like his movies but he never has like that full tilt realization that he's doing it wrong Mm because he keeps doing it and he keeps doing it the same way he's discouraged because he can't get things made and people don't like the things he's made but he never at any point has any sort of imposter syndrome where he feels like he's not up to this because that's all he does and it's all he wants to do. And that sort of unstoppable drive of optimism of like, people are not going to like it, but I'm still going to make my thing is really kind of charming. And the, the, the notion that like, he thinks everything he is putting on paper is Citizen Kane. Literally. He literally thinks everything he is doing is Citizen Kane to the point where there, there's a scene where he gets to meet Orson Welles. <laughs> and that's such a good moment where, where they kind of are a kindred spirits about like the way studios interfere and stuff and like the the fact that you have to say that you did everything your way. And Orson Welles says that because the, the studios chopped up all of his movies and he never gets creative control and stuff. And he arguably made the greatest film ever made. And Ed Wood does it so that he can make Plan 9 from Outer Space. 
It's so good. <laughs> it's it is very impressive, honestly, and it's it's so funny because it kind of recontextualizes like Burton's isms um, throughout the entirety of his career after this, and makes you wonder like. Is the white paint and the Dan Danny Elfman and the Johnny Depp and Helena Bottom Carter, is that all like, this is just what he wants to do. He always wants to put his friends in, yeah. in these things. Or is it that like the studios just expect him to do that so he can't make a movie without doing those things now? Um, is, is like a point, true question. By this point, I think it's the former. But as time okay. goes on, I think it becomes the latter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, no, in the 90s, it's certainly that, that he wants to work with his friends. I'm talking about, like, as time has went on, yeah, as yeah. his career keeps going back to these same familiar elements. Yeah. Um, How much of it is, no, the studio just expects you to do this, because this is the the proven formula. This is the machine. Um, yeah, by the time you get stuff. to, like, Dark Shadows and stuff, it's definitely, like, that's what the studio wants, as opposed to, like, when this was being made there there was that element of he just wants to hang out with his friends uh oh, which is sure. funny because um this is a movie that uh most of his friends are not actually in because uh there is no danny elfman doing the score there is no helena bomb carter um and part of the reason for for danny elfman not being a part of it is um the two got into an argument over nightmare Before christmas really yeah in what regard? I've not heard this story. Oh, I don't know what the details are. Apparently, they just like got into a disagreement about it. That's a that's a weird one um, because Nightmare Before Christmas has nothing to do with Tim Burton. Really, he was the producer of it, and he got his name before it. Um, I mean, but, it's his yeah. book still, but yeah, yeah. But he he wrote the movie, um, but it was directed and changed up considerably, uh, and his name is just kind of on it. And Danny Elfman did the music for that, which just came out a year before. And then because of the disagreements Elfman and Burton had on that movie is part of why he didn't pursue Danny Elfman to do Ed Wood. Uh, and instead, he got Howard Shore to do the score, who's still really good. But it, it does sort of feel like this is just knockoff Danny Elfman. Mm. I, I honestly didn't notice the score at any point. It's That's something I usually don't notice unless it's like a... Um recurring theme or something i usually don't notice score until like multiple viewings mm. um yeah. yeah i don't know it's a, it a fucking kind of crazy movie to watch and like it just took me back to like when i was making movies with my friends and we were doing a lot of, you know the gorilla filmmaking this would be like proto gorilla filmmaking even um just the fact that they like broke into the warner lot to steal the octopus and shit uh, you know, I just remember doing shit like that, like, not breaking into places, but just doing crazy shit to get a shot, and, like, I remember there or was like, a time like, where... Uh, at the beginning, where, like, they get a shot and the cops are, are coming in, they're like, we don't have permits, run! Yep, yep, <laughs> um, like, cops shutting you down fucking sucks dick. I remember one night where, um, we're gonna film a scene in uh, a local park, and it was, you know, a horror movie, so it had to be night. And we're just getting set up, we're getting everything ready. My buddy Nick is filling a condom with fake blood so we can strap it onto one of our actors to uh, be a squib. Um, and a cop comes up because the park was closing. He's like, hey, what are you guys doing? And I'm calmly talking to this cop and trying to get him to just give us the okay to to finish filming that we're not going to be doing anything wrong and you know we're not vandalizing or anything we live in the neighborhood and stuff and uh then my buddy nick comes over with a fucking condom filled with fake blood he goes what the fuck's the problem here i work for the <laughs> parks department this is fine <laughs> <laughs> And that was that was the second time in, during that film where um where a cop showed up and uh and gave me a fucking heart attack so that was fun, um, but yeah like I just I don't know I got very nostalgic uh, watching some of the 
the kooky shit that they were doing to to get the films made. They're just going out in the middle of the fucking woods in the middle of the night to film some shit and make it a fake pond. Uh, the fucking scene where he's like fighting with the fake octopus actually looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> like he really, was, yeah. <laughs> he fucking sold it though. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's 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 got that sort of like naivete and optimism to it that's like really really infectious because even you as the viewer are watching this and you know like this is all garbage right like there there is mm-hmm. no illusion that you're under that that Ed Wood is secretly a brilliant filmmaker like from moment one that's not the case uh, but the the fact that he's just going around and like pointing to people and being like oh this guy would be perfect for my movie that he, like he's seeing the entire world filtered through that desire to just make movies and just do it with his friends and the people he cares about and like pulling them along the entire time um and representing this really interesting contrast to whatever what happened to Bela Lugosi in his life where post monster movies he wasn't getting really any work um he wasn't able to get his union benefits because he hadn't worked in a union picture in years by that point uh he'd become a morphine and a drug addict and like he multiple women that he had married and been with had left him and that he was he was in a in a sad state and like this is a guy who similarly always wanted to be an actor he worked on stage he worked in theater he got hired to play dracula in the dracula movie which was an adaptation of the stage play he started and not even an adaptation of the book. And so, like, you see this guy kind of rise up and Ed Wood definitely sees himself in Bela Lugosi. And then seeing him washed up like this, it doesn't spark any sort of, like, introspection on his part. It doesn't spark any sort of desire to, like, think about the industry he's in and the direction he might be headed in like another more more true to reality biopic might have gone instead he's just like oh this is the greatest actor of all time i gotta get him in my movies how come no one's hiring this man and like that that genuine sort of like optimism that you see the entire world through those kinds of those rose-colored glasses is really great um and speaking of rose-colored glasses it's a movie in 1994 that's entirely black and white that's insane how the fuck did he pull that off yeah, how um, the fuck did he pull that off? That's nuts. You know what? Maybe not though, because '90s, like retroactively thinking about it, '90s were a very experimental decade in film where we did shit that's just kind of crazy when you think about it. They did a shot-for-shot shot remake of Psycho. Yeah, Steve. yeah. That's ridiculous. Not just that they remade Psycho. <laughs> they made no improvements besides now it's in color and we have Vince Vaughn and William H. Macy. <laughs> like Probably everything was worse. <laughs> yeah. I don't <laughs> like we did a lot of weird shit in the nineties. It's just a very experimental decade in film. Um Yeah, you get the generation who grew up watching the really experimental uh, French New Wave of the late 60s and the American influence in the 70s grow up and make movies. And so in the 90s, you get lots of weirdos like Tim Burton. Uh, And Tim Burton's entire look and aesthetic is inspired by like 1920s and 30s German expressionism. And he gets to make a black and white movie that's really just about himself which is really impressive and really experimental, maybe of the decade, but still kind of surprising that he was able to get away with making an entire movie in black and white, but also pacing it and editing it and creating transitions like it's an old black and white movie. Like, this does not watch like a 90s movie, I don't think. The dialogue isn't like it's the 90s. The pacing isn't. The edits aren't. It feels like it's a movie that literally could have been made in like the 1940s or 50s. Yeah, um, to an extent. I don't think, like, I think the, uh, cross-dressing elements are very, um, what's the word I want here? Subversive. Even for the 90s, I think they're pretty fucking subversive. Um, the, like, I feel like we're just barely ready for that shit today. Mm -hmm. Uh... 
It was, it was interesting. I found myself watching that, and like he keeps saying the term transvestite, which would have been just been the term that they had at the time to identify as, but like that's kind of gone the way of like Negro or colored. Mm-hmm. Of like technically, it's not the wrong word to use, but it's become so uh, negatively connotated that it's not used anymore. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to figure out like what Ed Wood would. As at least as portrayed in the film, would be identified as today. Um, and I guess it would just be a drag queen. Because he says very blatantly that he is all man, he is still attracted to women, and that he seems to have no desire to do a sex change or be a woman. He just feels really comfortable in women's clothing. Yeah, no, um, the the real Ed would, would go out in public dressed in drag, um, and he had a name for that personality, too. He called it Shirley, or he called her mm-hmm. Shirley. Um, so, like, a lot of that is based in reality, and it's based on a biography of Wood that was, at the time, kind of recent. Uh, but Wood himself was very open about a lot of this stuff, and that's probably part of, historically, why the dude just doesn't come up a lot or gets just written off as the worst director of all time. Not to say that his movies don't have anything to do with that, because I'm sure they do. But you you got to imagine a a director who is also uh, dressing in women's clothing in public at that period of time probably got no charity or sympathy from anyone, Uh, especially when his movies aren't particularly good and he's hiring people who, like him, have similar sensibilities or inclinations, and you're not going to reward that in the system he's in. And I like the fact that in this movie, because this is something I feel like even we now we don't get right— the movie's not really judgmental about that whatsoever, and it's really open and clear for uh, for the audience immediately that what he gets out of it, why he does it, and at no point is the movie kind of condemning that for, to him as like some sort of like degenerate lifestyle. Like his source of failure is not associated with that at all. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it certainly doesn't, like, help endear him to anyone. Sure, yeah. But it's not any in any way, like, the sole driving force of his ineptitude as a filmmaker. You could um, say, right, like, if this movie was a biopic made in the 2000s, that's what the movie would be about, right? It would be this really gut-wrenching melodrama about Ed Wood who secretly dressed in women's clothing and was shunned by society for it. And you would like give the Oscar to like fucking Tom Hanks for playing Ed Wood wearing Agora sweaters. But Burton doesn't do that at all, right? He doesn't make this like an Oscar. He doesn't make this like a sop story. He just kind of takes the weirdness and eccentricities of, of Ed Wood in real life and transposes them on film in a way that he sees them, which is eccentric and interesting and fun. And like you look at Edward Scissorhands and the sweaters and the wigs that Ed Wood's wearing and you get the sense that in Tim Burton's mind these are the same thing that it's literally just some people like doing certain things that other people considered weird and there is nothing wrong with that and I think that's like a very modern sensibility um, Mm -hmm. for for Burton I I don't think that attitude was very uh, prevalent in the 90s or 2000s Um, or even now (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, I think Gen Z is so fucking weird because they're, like, almost insulted by, like, any kind of sexuality being portrayed um, in characters on screen or in media or whatever, but they will, like, fight to the death for some fucking OnlyFans model. So, like, (laughs) Gen Z confuses the shit out of me, to be perfectly honest. (laughs) But they seem more cool with it than, than I think certainly my generation did. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I say that, like, as someone, you know, I was a fucking teenage boy once. I remember being, oh, ew, gay stuff. Um, and, you know, I just fucking got over it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, it really doesn't affect me. And I don't know why I need to feel, like, so insecure in, in order to put on a show that, like, well, I'm not. I'm all man. Meanwhile, fucking Ed Wood in this movie is like, oh, no. I'm all men. I'm all man. I just really like to wear bras and panties. I'm like, <laughs> fuck it, you do you, bro. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I thought it was actually a really sweet scene when you get, like, the uh, the spook house. Uh, it was so cute, like, how he's so excited to go see that. Um, and, like, the ride breaks down for a minute, and he just stops there with this this new girl he's dating. He's like, 
just comes out to her, um, I guess we'll just use the big banner term as queer. Mm. Not as, like, gay, not as, just, like, the big banner term of queer as in strange. Um, and, like, he just comes out and she's like, oh, so it means you don't like to do it with girls? He was like, oh, no, I like that very much. I just like to wear their clothes, too. <laughs> okay. I'm like, that's, I don't know, I thought that was just actually a very sweet um, scene, that, like, that felt particularly modern. Like, I could probably upload that as a YouTube short or a TikTok or whatever and be like, Tim Burton had it all figured out back in 94. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and, and it would probably fucking pop off and do actual numbers. No, I mean, and I, Tim Burton would be like, motherfucker, how did he, he undercut me? <laughs> 30 <laughs> years later, he got my ass. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. And I feel like... Um... A lot of the the interesting aspects of what Tim Burton brought to this movie in the historical in the historical life of Ed Wood versus what he chooses to present are things that, in a more contemporary mindset, we might question in ways that are not super charitable or sincere. Um, like now, you might ask a lot of questions of like, what right did Tim Burton have to make a movie? about Ed Wood, who was a cross-dresser, if he himself is not a cross-dresser. Uh, like, get the fuck out. <laughs> right, yeah. No, like that, that's an attitude people have, though. And the rebuttal to that is that Tim Burton sees something of himself in this person, and that's what he chooses to bring out. He didn't have to be the same kind of person, but at the end of the day, what movies and what art do is that it gives you sympathy and understanding of different perspectives, and it presents them to you in a way that are approachable even if you don't live the same life. You don't have to be a South Korean woman who immigrated to the United States and learned English to like past lives. And in the same way, Tim Burton is, is doing something here with Ed Wood's life that has consequence for other people. But it's positive, and he's contextualizing it in a way that makes sense for him, which is just what everyone does. And again, this is, that's part, again why I wanted to like bring this up for History Month, in particular related to the conversations we had the last couple of weeks, because I feel like it is doing something that's like really towing the line between fiction and reality here that's hard to put into words, uh, that doesn't just come down to, is it a good movie or a bad movie, because it gets some people right and some wrong um his first girlfriend in the movie uh dolores fuller is someone a lot of people complain about that his portrayal wasn't sympathetic to her that um he kind of makes her seem like too much of a shrew uh and people were really mad about that um and i i can understand if you knew that person why you would say that but for her function in the movie i really don't see that criticism i don't think she's particularly bad i think she's just incapable of viewing life through the same honestly delusional lens that Ed does and I don't think she comes off as unsympathetic for not sticking around with him because at the end of the day if you were this dude's friend at a certain point you would have to dip too right like nothing is going this guy's way and he refuses to see it and if you have the ability to just kind of pal around with him good on you but I would not judge anyone for abandoning him either I mean, it's not like she just fucking cuts and runs on him the first time things get difficult. She right. sticks with him. She helps. She's like, she makes the point that she's literally been the one paying their rent mm -hmm. um, together, that she's been super supportive of him. And like, she was certainly gaining something from that because he was letting her star, giving her these big roles and all of the things he was doing. So she thought that, like, maybe if I just believe in him, it'll go places. You know, artists, they're kooky. Um, and I think for someone in, what is this, this set in the 60s? Uh, I think for someone in the 60s, having their boyfriend come out as queer like that, especially in the way he does, where it's like, he just informs her through a script for a movie yeah. that he's already going to do, and then she just opens a door and there he fucking is dressed in her clothes um i think the portrayal of her especially for a person of this time is actually pretty reasonable like i don't know anything about her in real life i don't know how cool or not cool she was with weirdness but i don't think that like the vast majority of her problem really comes from ed being queer it certainly doesn't help things it's more that like he's actually a pretty shit boyfriend to her. Yeah. 
Uh, like, I just, just full stop. Like, he gives away her part to someone for money that he didn't even, like, actually think through enough. Didn't secure the bag first. Um, he is literally mooching off of her. And he's making these really fucking bad movies and then just, like, moping around the house waiting for her to bring him back around and get him his motivation back. He's... Yeah, like, again, what you were talking about earlier, where if you just portrayed it from a, um, objectivist outside perspective, Ed's a fucking jerk. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it works when you, when the, the soul of the movie works in the way in which you're trying to get inside Ed's head and see the world through his eyes. Um... That opening scene, or not even opening, but like that really early on scene that you mentioned where like he comes out to her through a movie script, I feel like is is such a cool point in the movie to kind of unpack the whole thing because he has no connection really to this producer who wants to make this movie. He really cares nothing about the real story. Um, he wants to make a movie. He sees he's in, which is the fact that he's a crossdresser. Not even that he's trans, but that he's just a crossdresser. Uh, and he takes that as an opportunity to get hired in the movie. And he's not thinking about it on any deeper level. Uh, he gets the job. He writes the script. And the real him comes out on paper because that's what he does is that everything he puts on paper is an honest reflection of himself, um, which opens the door to that larger criticism of if if everything inside you is just this crap, then maybe you're not the greatest person in the world. But that doesn't make it insincere, and it doesn't mean that he shouldn't be allowed to make these kinds of sincere, although bad, movies. And the fact that he comes out in that way where he announces he's going to play the part, that he's been doing this the entire time, that this is his way of sharing his world with people is really interesting, because then the whole rest of the movie is just that he makes friends by casting that random strangers in his movies that he gets to know through the roles that he set, he creates for them. Uh, and there is that sort of like double-edged sword that sort of, again, kind of black and white idea of if you're looking at this from one perspective, this guy does not understand reality. He doesn't treat people like they're real people. He's writing them roles in his life in a way that's actually kind of manipulative and awful. But on the other end of the spectrum, there is this this innocence and this joy and this camaraderie they all have each, with each other where he's trying to fit everyone he cares about into his life. And his way of doing that is just making movies with them, and he's proud of that and he enjoys that. And so like I, I wouldn't even necessarily call this like an uh like an overtly optimistic movie at all turns. I think there is like a lot of dark undertones hiding just below the surface of it. Uh, and I feel like all the characters get a lot of dimension when you start thinking about it from the perspective of what exactly is Ed putting them through. But that never takes away from the joy of it. And I feel like it captures that dissonance of trying to make a movie really well, where you become a bit of a snake oil salesman simply by necessity. And being unable to operate within that system get you cast out and so like ed could go on and make tons of indie movies that all fucking suck but bella lugosi gets hung out to dry and so does fucking orson wells and orson wells is for a lot of people the greatest filmmaker of all time and like what does that say about the movie industry <laughs> well i mean fucking orson wells wasn't willing to get baptized for his movies so <laughs> I love, by the way, that they got the guy from Pinky and the Brain to voice Vincent D'Onofrio as Orson Welles. <laughs> it's so layered, I fucking love that. <laughs> I, You know, it's funny you mentioned that, because I did, like, remember thinking something seemed off about that scene. I didn't realize he was dubbed, but as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh, that's what it was. Yeah, it's really it's really weird because they get um, Maurice LaMarche who voices Pinky and Pinky, or sorry, voices Brain in Pinky and the Brain, and Brain is just doing an Orson Welles impression, and then Vincent D'Onofrio plays Orson Welles, but he's voiced by the guy who's famous for doing an Orson Welles impression. That's so weird. <laughs> I don't know what it is about ADR and films it's like we used to be really really good at it and like the night this being in the 90s is when um 
not when, but shortly after we started tr transitioning away from everything ADR, because, like, the original trilogy of Star Wars movies, everything was just ADR. Mm -hmm. They just came in and redid the audio later in post, because none of the on-set audio capture was, like, good enough yet. But you would never would fucking know. No. But, like, here we are in the 90s, and it's like, no, that's really obvious. Like, <laughs> you, you don't necessarily know unless you know, but, like, you know enough to know something's different. Something's not right with it. It's interesting. The evolution uh, of, like, moving from black and white to, um, not black and white, but moving from silent films to uh, audio films is really interesting because of how much experimentation had to go into just, like, how the fuck do you rig up actors so that the microphone is within range without being in frame? Uh, and who look at all these actors who are great at pantomime, but they don't have a, a movie star voice and what happens to them. Um, like you look at like classic movies like Singing in the Rain, which is its own like really weird meta circle because it's a movie that happens as we shift away from black and white into technicolor but it's a movie set during the shift from silent to talkies and so it's about both of those things at once and like you get a lot of interesting little tidbits here and there of like how does the movie production have to change in order to add sound in the first place and then just last year you had a really underrated movie babylon um that does the same thing where you have margot robbie as like this really great silent actress that starts making talkies. And there's like this 10 minute scene where they just have to keep redoing the same opening beat because no one can fucking get the sound equipment in the right position. Cause no one's ever done this before. It's really, really good. If you haven't seen Babylon, I'd recommend it. I think it's a great movie, but just look up the Margot Robbie scene where they're trying to film a scene with audio. It's fucking incredible. Damn, that sounds fucking hype. It's um, so good. You literally see this poor woman lose her goddamn mind if she has to say the same line one more time. I mean, that's that's pretty like universal for actors, though. Like, that's where the saying like "don't work with children or animals" comes from. It's because you could do the most fucking perfect take ever, but if the dog's not looking the right way on screen, you have to trash it. Yeah, and just. Could you imagine just how frustrating that would get so quickly? Like, two or three takes and you'd just be fucking done with the goddamn thing. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. <laughs> it's oh like when, when you see, like, anytime you see a movie character eat food, you should you should pray for that actor because they have had to stuff that thing in their mouth so many times over the course of a day. I mean, it's and it's probably not actually food, too, is the, yeah. the worst part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that scene uh chris evans talks about like eating that pack of biscuits on knives out and like how many bags of those they had to go through jesus christ I'm gonna vomit <laughs> thinking about that i know it sounds mm. miserable <laughs> yeah i don't know um back to back to ed wood yeah yeah <laughs> uh what do you think of of some of like the bit players because we've talked a lot about like ed and and like his his love life and we've talked a lot about bella lugosi uh, what do you think about some of the, the surrounding characters? Like, Vampira fucking sent me, because I actually did not know about her. Yeah. Like, when she started thinking, I'm like, that can't be Elvira started in that early? That can't be, right? She was nope. in the 80s. And it's like, nope, she fucking stole that bitch's act. <laughs> yeah, no, Vampira <laughs> came first, and she actually sued Elvira for stealing her act, and it didn't go her way. I mean, I don't know how she didn't win because it's the very same obviously. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Um, Vampire is a lot of fun. Um, I I like the bit um, after she loses her job and they're in the cafe and she's got like the sunglasses on and she's like, "I'll be in your movie, but like, you can you like minimize my role? Can I not speak? Something like that. Like that's really cute." Um, but the wrestler dude. I loved him. What what the fuck was his name? Um, whoever, <sighs> Tor Johnson, Tor Johnson, yeah, Tor Johnson. Where uh, he sees him like be this big burly man in a wrestling ring, and then when he's in the back getting a massage, uh, and he's got he's like just fucking eating a rotisserie chicken, eating a fucking rotisserie ch chicken covered like head to toe in hair, and he's like 
you're an actor. <laughs> and that's so good. You ever uh, thought about being in movies? I'm too <laughs> ugly. <laughs> I, and that that's part of like where the endearing side of of, of Ed comes in because like you look at that scene and he's like oh this is kind of cute where he's just like no he sees something in this dude and you got all these great bits of physical comedy with that guy because he's just a big hulking wrestler and he's like barreling through the this movie set um, the bit uh, towards and the fact Ed- that like he learns to act by watching Bella Lugosi overact yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the bit at the end when like he finally gets his way uh filming plan nine and like he pops out of the grave but he gets stuck and then the two cops have to go in and pull him out and the whole time you're just wondering like so that shot is ruined right there is no way you're keeping that shot right no we're gonna keep that shot (laughs) (laughs) just reminds me of the fucking um the simpsons episode where they where mr burns makes the movie about himself and, and it, like, you get to the scene where he's trying to, like, glamorize his life, and he's, like, on a horse, and he's gonna go, um, fight the enemy, uh, to save the day. And he says, yeah, and the horse just starts fucking, like, galloping away, he's, like, falling off the back, and getting dragged, and sh- bumping into shit. And it just cuts to the movie theater, he's like, we did 96 takes, and that was the best one. <laughs> <laughs> No, absolutely. Uh, and then I loved um, I loved Bill Murray in this. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. It was a pretty bit part for, for Bill Murray. I, was, I, I thought he was maybe a little underutilized, honestly. <laughs> uh, that's fair. But there, there there's definitely some stuff there um, with Bill Murray's character being like an actual drag queen and making jokes about going down to Mexico so that he could get a sex change. Um, that's, again, another bit that sort of feels like this movie is definitely feels a lot more like queer and sex positive than I think anyone was expecting in 1994. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. Um, what's the fucking one where they got the van out in the desert? That's like the 90s as well, isn't it? Which one? Um, uh, it's like an Australian film. Uh, uh, where it's a bunch of drag queens get on a van to... Uh, go across the desert and go to a, a like big drag thing, drag event, um, the little rain or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. Um, I think that's like late '90s. It's a just interesting era for this stuff, I suppose. Um, kind of maybe informs why it was why some of these things became a little bit more acceptable. Mm-hmm. As we've we've come to the modern day is you know the seeds are planted in the mid to late nineties and then things just kind of inch 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 in more. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, those got those are all pretty good. Uh, again, the vampire just fucking killed me because she was just like I really like Elvira. I watched Elvira's movie, which is also not very good, but very funny. <laughs> uh, how fucking gets out of a or is walking down the street and something lands on her fucking noggin, and guy is all concerned. He goes, "Oh my god, how's your head? I haven't had any complaints yet." <laughs> um, fucking shit, so good. shit post lines. <laughs> um, but like, I don't know. It's it's kind of interesting to see just. The, the way that developed, I'd, I'd never heard of Vampire before. I was just like, oh, it's Elvira? She really started that early? No. No. Uh, that, was, that was an interesting thing to discover. Uh, and the fact that she's just like wearing the same costume in the movie is really, really funny. Uh, Ed Wood fucking found someone else who was like floundering and was like, ah, I'm gonna jump onto your rising star. <laughs> <laughs> so this is interesting um sure. just just down the rabbit hole of of elvira versus vampira um so vampira sues elvira for literally stealing her whole act uh, and then the court sides with elvira um and their reasoning is actually kind of interesting because they said essentially what vampira is attempting to copyright is just wearing a dark black dress with movie props 
and the actual character of Elvira is nothing like Vampira because it's a parody with graveyard puns and comedic dialogue, and you can't trademark those things. So if Elvira is infringing on Vampira, you'd have to say that Elvira's act is the same as Vampira's, and apparently it's not. I mean, maybe, like, the portrayal that Burton does here is intentionally leaning on making it more apparent. Probably, um, yeah, yeah. I've so never there, seen there, Vampira, so... Yeah, I'd have to see, like, an actual <laughs> Vampira fucking broadcast or something to really get it down, but man, oh man, if, like, if even a fraction of it is the same, like, nah, come on. Come on. That's, that's <laughs> just... Get the fuck if out. Burton is intentionally trying to, like, ham it up, it does kind of fit with that whole sort of, like, cyclical nature of the whole movie of, like, how things are influencing each other. Like, the direct line from Captain of Dr. Caligari to Bela Lugosi to Ed Wood and Vincent Price all the way down to Tim Burton and then back again would be the same thing that's kind of going on with Vampire and Elvira and, like, a microcosm. Possibly. I think that might be a little bit of a stretch, but possibly. Um... It was just, I don't know, it was just an interesting little little tidbit. Uh, the the younger actor in this, that's that's playing one of Ed's, like, crew members or whatever, uh, I thought he was a bit underrated. Um, like, we, we haven't really mentioned him much, and he's not, like, he's definitely not, like, the funniest character to watch or anything, but just the way that he just rolls with stuff and kind of comes off as just like this kid you can tell anything to just made him a really funny character to me. The kid that really... like gets the Bella Lugosi lookalikes and stuff? Yeah, well I was yeah. thinking like when he played Fu Manchu you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 that's, yeah, that's a really good line. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you do definitely get the sense of him of like uh, of feeling like their relationship is like this kid clearly feels like he's being mentored by Ed Wood in a certain way, uh, and in, in, and it's a tragic relationship because Ed is not going to help his career whatsoever. I mean, you know, any work is work. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's just like a lot of really good scenes in this that are like again just really funny. That we were talking about the uh, the first girlfriend character, and I just really like their breakup scene quite a bit where Ed's, you know, fucking doing a, a strip tease and everything and dancing with Bella Lugosi and she just fucking had enough of it. She goes, like, what's the exact wording? She says, these movies are crap and you're all fucking kidding yourselves if you don't think they are. <laughs> like, she just fucking tells it like it is. And it's kind of, you know, endearing, honestly. It just that, that was one of the moments that just made me crack the fuck up because I'm like, Okay, so it's not like they were just making these and everyone was pretending they were actually going to be good. Like, they had someone on the on the lot telling them that the movie was bad. It, it does kind of, like, raise that fun contradiction in the whole thing of, like, this whole movie is very optimistic and happy about everything, but everything you're watching is kind of awful. And then uh, Dolores calls out how bad everyone's movies are and leaves. And then the final note title card is, and by the way, he wrote songs for Elvis. So she mm -hmm. just saved her fucking self from leaving. And that's kind of great. I, I love that it's got that extra layer of like, oh, so she was just successful. Okay. Yeah, like she's the one that didn't die a fucking failure. <laughs> <laughs> but did she have artistic integrity? That's the actual interesting question. Yeah, that's, that's the there, question. Right? Like, yeah, she made, she, she apparently wrote songs for Elvis but have you ever heard of her before? Do you think you'll ever hear anyone talk about her since? You know? Yeah, and especially when it comes to music uh, and Elvis and, and songwriters, like how much of that work is homogenizing your voice so that it comes off from this inoffensive every person like Elvis, right? Like people mm -hmm. who write pop songs have a whole army of songwriters, but the the trick is to not make any one song stand out. All of them have to kind of have the same voice and so if you're successful doing that you're a success but are you like an artist are you a person who's putting your personal experiences on paper in a way that allows you to self-reflect and present yourself into the world in an honest way uh and maybe you are maybe she was i don't know but there's certainly a contrast between 
doing that, writing songs for someone else who gets all of the image and the glory versus making movies no one will ever see, but at least they're your movies. Absolutely. And I think, I think it like leads into that, that distinction um, in arts, which is there's like the craft, the skill in and of itself. And then there's the kind of the muse, the ambition, the, the vision. Um, and it's interesting because she would seem to embody the character that actually has the craft and the skill and Ed is the vision, the ambition, but like they're both kind of, it's interesting that they're, they're together at the beginning of this movie because they're, um, ideally they should be like lifting each other up. Like she's adding the craft to his vision and, and refining it. Um, and that's not what happens at all. That's why they end up having to go their separate ways. Um, because they are just, like, essentially, they are the unchecked versions of both of those things. What is craft without vision? What is vision without craft? Mm -hmm. um, you get kind of, you know, Ed, and then you get, like, here's this forgettable person that, like, went on and was successful, but no one cares. Because she didn't do anything. She did stuff for others. Um this is a very, very fascinating film to watch. I love it. I think it's great. Um, unless you had something else, I did want to mention and kind of go on one other tangent if you've if you've got a minute on it. Uh, absolutely. All right, all right. So I want to I want to talk about how this fits in Tim Burton's larger work, and okay. what specifically is is this one kind of unlocking that makes that comes from the others because. You've got Beetlejuice, Batman, Edward Scissorhands, and Batman Returns that all come out before this. Uh, and if you watch those movies in sequence... I thought Returns uh, was... No, that'd be forever. It was 95. Never mind. Ignore me. <laughs> yeah, no. It's, Batman is 89, and then Returns is 92. So it's like immediately after. Um, but in all those movies, um, you're getting established and introduced to what Tim Burton's sensibilities are, which a lot of people just kind of say is like this gothy emo uh aesthetic and not a lot more than that but tim burton is actually at least in those early films really disciplined and interesting and he's borrowing a lot of his set design and his ideas about miniatures and puppets and stuff from old 1920s and 30s movies and german expressionist ideas of like painting the backgrounds and stuff so like he's got a lot of old school weird movie influence but at the end of the day, what he's really after in all of those movies is what is the horror of of day to day life? What's the horror of suburbia? Um, in something like Beetlejuice, none of the people in the house are afraid of the ghosts because they want to make their money back on selling the house. Edward Scissorhands is really similar, where Edward comes down from the from the big castle and he enters this like technicolor dream house of, of suburban neighbors and stuff, and he's immediately an outcast there. And their ideas of success and progress and how they, they try to hide who Edward is to fit into that lifestyle is the text of that movie where he's not the monster society itself kind of is and not in a way where it's irredeemable but there's definitely a tension there um like like it or hate it batman returns is ultimately about a lot of these same things where it's about the monsters that we make ourselves but in becoming monsters are we not also at the same time kind of subversing the things in day-to-day -day life that we should not be taking for granted uh, that everything, every character in that movie that is disfigured or weird in a way, Batman, Penguin, Catwoman, they're all doing it because society as it is pushed them in this direction. And are they any worse than what the world made them? Uh, and I think Ed Wood actually has a lot to say on that same subject because we keep talking about like pushing back the, the lens and thinking about Ed from an objective point of view. And Ed's probably not a good person. Um, he clearly is very manipulative. Uh, he clearly is a terrible boyfriend, like we talked about with Dolores. Um, his movies are not good, and he so easily fits into this deluded world of if he just becomes a, a quick-talking movie producer-style person, that he can just keep getting his movies made, and he's not understanding how the world really works, and he's not introspecting at all about maybe his failure has to do with him and not the outside world. And so in that way, Ed is kind of a monster on that level. 
and he's becoming more and more grotesque as he's trying to get himself in line with the rest of the world and trying to become a successful movie maker in the same way as everyone is expecting him to, and he never quite can. And he's constantly pushed out of that world, which is usually the opposite direction of where a Tim Burton movie goes. And so at the end, when you get that scene with Orson Welles and like he has that connection uh, between artists and like he gets to call him Ed and then he calls Orson Orson where like they feel that sort of camaraderie um, he gets that opportunity in that moment to kind of really ask himself what exactly does he want to do and he wants and he just wants to make movies he wants to make movies that are his vision he wants to make movies with his friends he enjoys that process he is in it for that and that alone and when you end the movie on that title card of worst director of all time you're saying that the reason ed wood is an interesting person that to make a whole movie about and why he's so encapsulative of tim burton's career is because he's the guy that tried to fit into that suburban society that Tim Burton's always satirizing and couldn't. And because he couldn't, he is famous. I have absolutely nothing to add except for the fact that I still think it's really funny that the movie is called Beetlejuice and Beetlejuice <laughs> is barely in the movie. Um, <laughs> that is that is all I can think of to, to jump on with what you're saying there. Um, well, that's and fair. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's that's all I got. Because <laughs> um, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think it is a really interesting statement on. I'm surprised that Tim Burton made this movie when he did. So early, um, yeah. Yeah, like this. It, it it's really interesting to watch this movie, having lived and like grown up with Tim Burton movies my whole fucking life. It seems like he releases one every like two to three years almost. Um, He's not like a Tarantino where he's like, oh, no, I'm only going to make a couple of movies. I'm only going to make like 10. Now he's like, I'll make a fucking movie whenever I goddamn please. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, you know, it's it, he's kind of been there my whole life. So it's and, and I remember like being sick of Tim Burton um, and and like his stylistic things and just like, OK, you just keep making the same fucking thing over and over and over again. Um, and again, we talked about that earlier, how I wonder how much of that um is like studio insistence on a Tim Burton production now and how much of it is like no he still really enjoys these these kinds of aesthetics and choices um because it was always so good whenever he'd like break that format like one of my favorite Tim Burton movies for a long time and, and still to this day is like Big Fish because you find out that movie's directed by Tim Burton you go oh wait for real it looks nothing else like anything he's ever done. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of interesting to see Ed Wood so late in life like this, or not late in life, but so far into Tim Burton's career, and to know that it came so early uh, is, yeah. is just really interesting. It's super weird, because the, the thing I would compare it to most recently is Oppenheimer, because that's a movie as much about Robert Oppenheimer as it is about Nolan's entire filmography. And it took Nolan 20 years to build up to uh, the ultimate Nolan movie. And it took Tim Burton, like, 10, right? Like, he'd mm-hmm. make a movie, like, 5 or 10 years, and he makes make Ed Wood. And I'm not in a disparaging way, but I do feel like Tim Burton's quality and artistry kind of dips after this point. Um, I love Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow is one of my favorite Tim Burton movies, and that came out in 1999. But, like, from here forward you can kind of see what you talked about, like where we grew up with Tim Burton and he kind of becomes a parody of himself because after this, you get planet of the apes, uh, Charlie of the chocolate factory, corpse bride, Sweeney Todd, Alice in Wonderland, dark shadows, like all of these movies that just sort of feel like Tim Burton light. But when you go back in time and you look at like his, his string of like his first, like five or six movies, and they're all kind of bangers. And it's it's kind of sad to see that maybe he peaked too early. Or maybe he just became Ed Wood. Maybe he just decided that he likes doing this regardless of whether or not other people like the movies. And he kept going. And given how much of himself he puts into Ed Wood, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Um, like, I don't know if you watched Wednesday, but I thought Wednesday was terrible. And he fucking directed a couple episodes of that show. 
Okay, I didn't like Wednesday, but that's mainly just because I've been really bothered by, like, that and the animated Adams Family movies that came out recently. Yeah. Um, with doing this thing of, like, making Wednesday hate her family. That just feels wrong to me. Yeah. Um, wanting to kill Pugsley is completely different than, like, doing this, like, teenage girl doesn't like her family gag with Wednesday, and I just don't care for it at all um though i will say i really did like jenna ortega as wednesday i thought her um portrayal was really really solid uh so i guess i'm more middle of the road on wednesday than you are uh yeah and i mean i i just say that to to say like clearly the a lot of the work for higher stuff he's done since like fucking dumbo um like th- th- there's definitely a a hill he's he's hopped over here where he must just like making the movies or being part of the process and is less concerned with all of his movies kind of building towards a very specific statement because i think you mm-hmm. could like do a marathon of beetlejuice batman edward scissorhands batman returns uh and ed wood and get like actually a very solid foundation of a guy progressing and growing um and then post sleepy hollow it feels like that kind of stops possibly uh again i I quite like big fish um yeah big Big fish Fish is good um i don't dislike charlie the jock factory and i like corpse bride but certainly i feel like they're a lot lesser than the early movies yeah it's so weird i i think we can all agree that the problem with corpse bride is he doesn't end up with Emily. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. like the cardinal sin that movie cannot get over. Every time I'm thinking about Corpse Ride, I'm like, oh man, I really want to like this movie. And then I remember, oh, that's right. He and Emily are not, aren't together by the end of that movie. And what the fuck's the point? <laughs> it, feels, it feels like it cops out in a way that Edward Scissorhands doesn't cop out. It's really strange. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Anyway... All right, I think that pretty much does it for Ed Wood. This is a good time. This I was a good this time. One quite a bit. I'm glad uh, you this... liked the movie. Oh yeah, this was fucking fantastic. Um, I I remember he... I remember hearing about it years ago. I'm like, oh, that does sound like a good one. I'd like to watch that, and just never got around to it. So it was really fun to get that chance. Um, let me look up. I I had it. Um, okay. We're going to review next week, because I did a discussion last time, and Alfie's ass isn't here. So we're going <laughs> to review next week um, Excalibur from 1981, uh, directed by John Borman. Um, Excalibur. Interesting. Yeah, just kind of in the fucking mood for some sort of sorcery shit. Uh, and, you know, it's History Month, but King Arthur is set in the real world, so fuck it, I'm going to say it counts. Um... <laughs> It, it's it's set in the mythic history of the thing. If we could fucking review, like, Troy or whatever on this show, we can review fucking Excalibur. I don't I mean, have to justify myself to you, Steve. This is my show. <laughs> we we did Conan the Barbarian and um, the Batman, like, back-to-back, like, a year ago, so I don't, I don't blame you for picking this. I've never seen this. I just, I was like, all right, what's some, what am I in the mood for? And I'm like, looking around my room, like, looking at my fucking Lego castle thing. I'm like, yeah, I want to talk about some castle shit. <laughs> uh, so what, what what fits in there with that? King Arthur. What are King Arthur movies? That looks like shit. That looks like shit. That's from 1953. I'm not going to fucking watch that. Ooh, <laughs> Excalibur. The 80s? The 80s is a good decade for film. So let's fucking go. Oh, um, boy. <laughs> oh boy i'm excited i'm intrigued i'm intrigued to see what your what your roll of the die has done for us yeah uh, who fucking knows we'll see all right uh everyone thank you so much for watching until next time i'm the philosopher and i am the historian and we are your geeky gentlemen and we will be discussing things